But hi, everyone. I am Tara Moore, and I'm the Director of Conservation Partnerships for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, and we are here today in the third of the reptile series. So thank you for joining us. We'll be learning about lizards today, which I am super excited to learn about. I have never been on a lizards webinar, so this is pretty cool. I'm excited to have Jeff here. Um, we are gonna start off with just a little poll. Um, so if everyone wants to look on their screen in the top right hand corner, there should be these three shapes. There is a triangle, a square, and a circle, and it says activities. If you scroll over it, there will be a poll that is launching right now. So it should be up there. If you wanna go ahead and click on that, it should appear with a little dot next to it as well. So you can click on that. Oh, we have some votes coming in. All right, let's see. Do you have lizards in your backyard is the question. I'll, I'll just give ourselves one more second to answer this. We have a lot of votes rolling in. Okay, last call, last call for votes. All right, so we have 13 votes for people who have lizards in their backyard and four votes for no. So all right. It seems like we have a lot of lizards out there and a lot of people who are seeing them in their yards. So pretty exciting. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Ann Summers and she is on the board for the North, uh, the board, the, excuse me, the board for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And she also has a whole bunch of other roles and she is an amazing teacher and a herpetologist. So I will turn it over to her. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad to see people here. We have over 40 people. That's fantastic. Uh, we're going to also do ask you to uh, mute your lines, if you can. Most people are muted, I see. And also, a lot of you already know this, but at the top, next to the activity button, we just used for the poll to the left of that, is the chat feature. So if you click on that, you can see, see um, messages that other people are putting in, and you can put a message in. And if you put questions in, we will get those to Jeff e either soon after you put them in or at the end. So with that, we introduce Jeff Hall, who I call the North Carolina State Herpetologist, but that's, what is your technical title, Jeff? I think my technical title is Wildlife Biologist 2. Okay. <laughs> but I usually tell people that I'm a herpetologist and that I work with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. So That's right. Jeff has been a, a great blessing to the state of North Carolina and to the Wildlife Resources Commission. I've worked with him for many years now on a lot of different projects, and I'm happy to be with him here today. So with that, Jeff? Take it away. Sounds good. Let me see if I can get my screen up and running here. Okay, everybody see my screen and Looks Tara? great. Yep. Perfect. So yes, uh, alliteration is our friend, right? Lovely lizards. So we will focus on North Carolina, of course, but uh, we'll, we'll go through a few various things along the way. Uh, just a very quick three second uh, uh, commercial. Uh, the program that I work for, uh, Wildlife Diversity Program within the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission Division of Wildlife Management. Uh, much of the work that we do is supported by the North Carolina Non-Game and Endangered Wildlife Fund. There are a couple ways that you can potentially uh, participate with this program. You can get the really super awesome Pine Barrens Tree Frog uh, Specialized Vanity License Plate, and a portion of that sale goes towards this uh, fund or you can contribute with your state income tax refund uh, in the coming year. You might have seen that line before and never known, well, I wonder where that wildlife money goes. Well, it goes to support work of non-game uh, species uh, like in this wildlife diversity program. And then finally, you can just out, uh, donate outright um, through the uh, ncwildlife.org give uh, address there. You can give directly to the non-game endangered wildlife fund and those monies get matched against federal dollars. And so uh, every piece of every, every dollar that we have in there is really, really valuable and really goes towards uh, a lot of the species that we'll be talking about today. 
Also want to just bring your attention to North Carolina Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, ncpark.org. I help coordinate this group. I'm really not going to talk about it today, but you're welcome to go check out that website if you want to learn more and you can join for free. So we're talking about lizards and they are reptiles. So it's kind of important to start this conversation off with what in the world is a reptile? Well, it used to be a little bit uh, we used to understand things a little differently than we do now. Our current understanding makes the definition of a reptile a little bit more difficult. So if you look there on the right, reptiles is not a group that really it makes exact sense the way we currently consider it, unless we are to include birds as a part of them. Um, so you see up there on the, on the right part of the screen, this is a uh, a table showing relatedness between different types of animals. So you see mammals up top, then you see reptiles, amphibians, fishes of various kinds. And this is just the closer the bars are to, to each other, the closer they are related to one another. And so if you're trying to come up with groups or names for these different cre creatures that fit in these groups, this is the way that you can do that by looking at how closely they are related to one another. Here's another graph zooming in on some of that same thing and, and getting into some of those same questions that people often have. Dinosaurs, are they lizards, are they reptiles, what are they? Well, if you look at this graph here, it makes things even a little bit more confusing. You'll notice that there is a common ancestor for crocodilians, most of the things that we know as dinosaurs and birds, but notice that lizards and snakes are actually not in that same group. They're a little bit earlier on. So if we wanna include all these things together, it gets really confusing, right? So here's our group that we're talking about today, lizards and snakes. And there are a number of folks that recognize the group reptilia or reptiles to only include lizards and snakes. And that all of these other groups are in different um, orders of, of animals completely differently. Notice the, the graph on the left doesn't even have turtles in it. So the turtles that you see uh, on the right is actually this bar, if we could see it, it attaches out a little further out here, which means that it's not quite as closely related to some of these other things. So what does this all mean? Well, I'm not gonna go into a lot of this today, but I did want to give you this perspective on what we think of as a reptile isn't always as clear today as what we might've thought years ago. And you know, most of the time when people say reptiles, they mean the group that's in the box here. I just wanted to note that that isn't necessarily the best way really to think about how these things are related to one another. So anyway, Jeff, I'll give Jeff, you, yeah. We're getting yeah. a couple of questions about tuateras. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So uh, that's a really weird critter. It's lizard-like. Um, it's found on uh, a few, at least one or a few islands in the New Zealand area. And it is just all by itself. Um, there are some indications there may be as many as two species, <laughs> but right now I think there's just one tuatara that is recognized. It's just a weird kind of outlier type critter. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't fit in with any of the other groups, so it's just a little bit different. Yeah. Okay, we good, Ann? Good. So I'm gonna zoom in on reptile characteristics the way that we currently think of reptiles just in the general knowledge. So when I say reptiles, I am including all those critters that were in that box, even though we, we know a little bit more about the, the true nature of the relatedness of these things, but they do share some similar characteristics. So one of them is that they are ectothermic. This is that term that a lot of times people will use cold blooded. That means the same thing but their blood isn't truly cold, right? So it doesn't exactly make sense. It just means ecto means outside. Thermic obviously means some sort of heat. So it means that they get their heat from outside of their body. Instead of endothermic, like mammals and birds, uh, these reptiles are ectothermic. Generally, they don't have a wide range of temperatures. So they, they can't necessarily be happy at 110 degrees Fahrenheit and also be happy at 18 degrees Fahrenheit, right? they actually have a fairly narrow band where they're comfortable. And so they do different things to make sure that they maximize that temperature. So they might bask if they're cold or they might burrow if they're hot or if it's cold. So they basically try to um, get themselves away from extreme temperature situations. 
They also do hibernate in the wintertime, but in ectotherms, the true term is actually brumation instead of hibernation. Just a little bit different uh, technique, but it, it basically is a similar type of thing where their uh, mechanisms slow down and they uh, take a period of time of inactivity. Now, some of our species do actually come out even on cool days in the wintertime, so they don't really do true brumation where they go in and, and don't come out for you know, several months. Uh, turtles are a good example of that. All of our reptiles have scales, and for reproduction, there's a little bit of variety, mainly in the snake group. Uh, within all the rest of them, they do lay eggs, and so for our lizards we're talking about today, all of our lizards in North Carolina lay eggs. And then finally, uh, reptiles are important parts of ecosystems. Uh, both prey and predator, and so um, they're, they're uh, an important piece in that whole food web. Any, any questions about basic reptile characters, Anne? No. Okay, good. So if we look at the world, there's over 6,000 lizard species currently recognized. And this map, the darker the color, the more lizard species are found in that area. So if you look at the tab on the right, the, the key on the right sort of shows you the coloration um, goes with the numbers of species that are found there. So if you look over there at Australia, on the right hand of your screen, you see, wow, they have got a lot of lizard species, over 800 species uh, found in that country. Notice this is done by country, so it's not necessarily, you know, any particular region. Um, if we look at our own North America, we notice that we're in that sort of 150 to 199 color range, and part of that is due to the southwest. You see that Mexico below us is in that color group that's also a lot of species, over 400 species of lizards. So our southwestern deserts uh, are really a place where we have great reptile diversity. If we zoom in a little bit, so this is North America, South America, Central, well, North and Central America. You can see that uh, we don't really have huge uh, species richness, huge numbers of species on the East Coast. Again, our great numbers of species in North America are largely driven by these southwestern areas. This will be southeastern Arizona here, where we see that we get into the 50 numbers of species. Whereas if we look at North Carolina, we're sort of in that 10 to 20 numbers of lizard species, and that's just exactly right, because we have 11 native species and two non-natives with some additional possible. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. So I am going to be using a, a, a type of map that you may or may not be familiar with on the right side of the screen. So when you look at a field guide, you may see a, a, uh, an entire range that might be all grayed in like the map on the left. The maps on the right recognize exactly the spots where specimens have been found in the past. So the colored in dots are representative of animals that actually have been collected and are in part of a collection at some museum somewhere. Could be at the North Carolina State Museum of Natural Sciences where most of the dots on the maps I'm gonna show you are, are housed, but some of them may be at other places like the Smithsonian Museum, et cetera, et cetera. The dots that you see that are hollow are represent where someone who knows what they're talking about documented a specimen, but they didn't actually collect the animal. So maybe I was able to see a particular species in an area. I was able to get a photograph, but I did not collect the actual animal. That might, rep that might uh, end up as a hollow circle on our map. Why are these interesting or different? So this is actually the range map, essentially of the same species between these two maps. One thing to find very interesting about the dot map approach is that it kind of shows you some places where we have some lack of our knowledge. In, in this case, if you look at that map on the right, you'll notice that right over here next to Pitt County is Green County. It looks like I don't, oh, there's my mouse. Green County here uh, does not have a dot for whatever this species is. Does that mean it doesn't occur in that county? Well, I would suggest probably not because there's all these dots all over the place. It probably does occur there. It just hasn't been documented there. So the maps like this can sometimes help us to know, well, you know what, we ought to go look for in Green County specifically for that, this, whatever the species is, so that we can learn more about the true distribution of the animal. So that's why I think these kinds of maps are helpful sometimes. 
And there are a lot of citizen science platforms that are out there that allow you to collect data like iNaturalist and some others that could then potentially be used for these sorts of maps. So we'll talk about that at the end. So as I mentioned, 13 different lizard species, 11 native and two introduced in North Carolina. I can tell you the two species, these two guys up here at the top, the same species, green and old, those two males were separated. No one was harmed in the making of this video. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna look at all of these species. So don't worry if, you, if you're not sure what any of these are, we're gonna talk about them. So one more little distinction about our, our lizards Sometimes people get confused between salamanders and lizards. Salamanders are amphibians and lizards are reptiles. And so some of those differences are that lizards have scales, salamanders do not. Almost all of our lizards have claws. There's an asterisk there. The reason not all of ours have claws is that we have some lizards that have no legs. You may have read in the teaser for this workshop today, did we learn about whether all lizards have legs or not? Well, there are some, three in North Carolina, that do not have legs. So because they don't have legs, they don't have arms, they don't have uh, fingers and toes, and they don't have claws on the ends of those. <laughs> so no claws on those guys. But for all the lizards that do have arms and legs, they do have claws. No claws on our amphibian friends, the salamanders. And of course, they do have a larval stage, many of them, not all of them, but many of them do, and they uh, have gills as larvae, and so, our lizards are all direct developers where they lay eggs and the eggs hatch out and they are tiny versions of the adults in the lizard world. What do lizards eat? Well, primarily they eat invertebrate prey. They eat lots of different insects, spiders, earthworms, um, and occasionally they eat each other. Notice I have a lizard in the upper right there. There are a few lizard species that will eat other lizards uh, sometimes even their same species, um, but uh, more often it's, it's a different species that they are, they are eating. But in general, most of our lizards are really going after these types of insects. And I don't mean these exact ones, these are just representatives. Probably the major vast majority eat crickets, grasshoppers, earthworms, beetles, insects, uh, excuse me, uh, spiders. So that's probably the number two, three, four, five, if you went down the list although moths and butterflies can be important in some diets as well. Interesting about lizards' tails. Some of you may have tried to catch a lizard before and maybe the tail popped off or parts of the tail came off. Well, it's because lizards' tails are actually constructed in a way that allows this. It's a fancy term, autotomy. What that really means is self-breaking or self-breaking off the tail. And so what that means is lizards have the ability for their tails to break off. Some of them can actually break their tails just there on their own. If you just barely touch them, they may actually almost like ejecting their tail off of their body. Well, they do this in a really kind of interesting way in their, the scale that the bones in their tail, the vertebrae are actually split down the middle with this special type of fracture plane. So this is a vertebrae, this whole thing here. And this is another whole vertebrae here, but you'll notice there's sort of a plate down the middle of that vertebra and that allows for the, that tail to be broken off right in the middle of that vertebrae. So when they break their tail, it doesn't split between the bones, like between one vertebra and another, it actually splits in half of that particular vertebra. And they have a variety of things set up so that there's very, very little bleeding, if any at all, when they do that. So they don't, they don't lose blood. And uh, there are some other pieces that, that make this go fairly, fairly well. So you may have a tail uh, that gets broken off like this animal. This happens to be an African lizard, but don't worry about that. Um, that tail will regrow but it will look a little different than the original tail looked. Notice that the coloration is a little different. Uh, the, the length may be a little different. Some things are just a little bit different because the new piece of tail will not have bone in it, generally speaking. It usually has um, uh, something else uh, that is uh, holding it together. So cartilage is what I was trying to think of. <laughs> so let's look at some of our species. Uh, the green anole is found across much of North Carolina. A lot of times I like to call them the Carolina anole. Anolis carolinensis is their scientific name. Uh, we won't go into scientific names a whole lot today, although you may see at different times 
uh, that there'll be an asterisk by different types of names. That's because different people recognize species by different names, but we're gonna mostly talk common names today. The green anole is really not the best name for this animal though, because it does change color. Notice the one in the upper right is obviously bright green, and that's a male, and he's expanding out that flap on his throat, which is called a dewlap, and he uses that for a variety of reasons. One, to attract females, but more often is used as a defensive measure. He's actually displaying to show everyone where his territory is. Hey, I'm over here, leave me alone. And they will display to other lizards, other types of wildlife, and even to people. If you approach a male that's feeling super frisky, uh, even as a, as a grown up <laughs> human, you walk over to him, he may very well do a bunch of head bobbing and flapping his dewlap at you, to letting you know that he is the big cheese around here and you should, you should just recognize that. Uh, it's pretty interesting how vigorously sometimes they defend the places that they're hanging out. But green anoles do change color. Sometimes that's due to temperature. So if you have a nice warm day, you're more likely to see an anole that might be green in color, like the one on the right. Whereas if you have a cooler day, um, you might be more likely to see an anole that's brown, like the one on the left. However, if you are lucky enough to be able to actually catch an anole, it will often change color right before your eyes. So changing color is often a response to some sort of threat. If you catch a green one, it may turn to brown. The one on the lower left, as I was photographing it, it was brown when I caught it, and I wanted it to be able to contrast with the bright green one. Notice that it started changing color. If you look in front of its eye, and just behind that dark spot behind its eye, which often they, that dark spot will come up when an oles are uh, scared or, or afraid, but you'll see there's a little bit of green back there. So I imagine if I kept uh, manipulating this lizard, I didn't, I let him go, but if I kept doing that, he would eventually, more parts of him would actually be green. We don't fully understand all the reasons that uh, animals do change color, but it is not to blend in with their surroundings, such as some other lizards do, like chameleons and some other things along those lines. It may work to serve for, for some purposes of uh, camouflage, but that's not the principal reason why they may be one color or another. All right. Oh, one, one last kind of interesting thing. Let's see. Uh, about a lot of species of lizards, and animals are certainly no different, is that after they shed their skins, they often eat their skins. So here's a great picture of a, of a green anole that's brown in color, but is eating his skin as he is shedding it. Um, that is a common thing. Not all lizards do that, but many of them do. It's a good way to recoup some of the uh, losses in minerals that they lose when they, when they shed their skins. Um, not all reptiles do this, of course. Uh, turtles generally don't, snakes generally don't, but lizards often do. Moving on, this is the eastern fence lizard. It's one of my favorites, uh, although I like to say that about, about every other species. Uh, I really enjoy all the reptiles that, that we have in North Carolina and all of those lizards. The, the fence lizard is most common really in the Piedmont and moving up into the foothills and mountains, but you can find them in the coastal plain. My experience is that they tend to be a little bit more spotty in their distribution in the coastal plain and not as easy to predict that you're going to find a fence lizard on a particular day. But uh, when you find one, really, really cool animals. They have really, really coarse scales that make them look to me like tiny little dinosaurs, uh, fascinating animals. If you happen upon a male, uh, the males have these bright blue hyacinth kind of colors on the sides and underneath the throat. Sometimes there's a little bit of purple associated with that as well really, really beautiful uh, coloration that they use for display uh, to try to attract a female during mating periods. I'm going to stop for just a second. Ann, did we have any questions about either of those two species? Oh, I, I think you're just on mute, Ann. Or Tara, either one. Yeah. yeah. We, we have gotten a couple of questions about the uh, tails. Okay. And so one question was, is there a particular vertebrae that that occurs at? And then Debbie no. Willis's question is, what is the maximum number of fractured planes documented? Tail, if the initial one is close to the tail tip. 
So the first question is, um, I forgot what the first one was. Are there, remind me the first question again, sorry. Let me go back. Just if there's a specific place where they break oh, yes. off, specific if there's place. like a vertebrae, so, yep. So no, there isn't. So let's just look at this lizard we're looking at right now, the ground skink. They're actually starting be, uh, after beyond the cloaca. So think of a little bit beyond those back legs that you see there in sort of the middle of your screen. Just a little bit beyond there would be the vent. And then just a little bit beyond there is basically where the tail starts. And those flat fracture planes are found in the vertebrae all the way out throughout the tail. So it can actually break just about anywhere uh, beyond that section where they start. So it's not one place. It could, it could be a number of different places where that tail can actually break off. How many have been documented or what's the most? I don't know the answer to that. My guess would be that it would be in one of our glass lizards that have really super long tails and tend to have um, a lot of places, a lot of those fracture planes uh, that maybe even more than, than most other lizard species, but I don't know a number. Thank you. Good, good questions though. So moving on to a slightly different group of, of lizards, these are the skinks. And the ground skink is the, is the only one of them that isn't really a good climber. The other skinks are good at climbing. Um, sometimes I'll have someone uh, know something about a skink, maybe a five-line skink, which we'll see in just a second, or ground skink. And they'll ask me, well, is a skink a lizard? And the answer is yes. Similar to how a newt is a salamander. Yes, newts are salamanders. Well, skinks are lizards. It's just another type of lizard. It doesn't happen to have lizard in its name, but neither does anole. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of lizards that don't necessarily have lizard in their name, but they are a lizard. So skinks are lizards. And oftentimes people see skinks out in the daytime uh, being reptiles. They're not worried about water loss uh, as salamanders would be. Sometimes people see a skink and they think it's a salamander. But again, if it's out during the daytime, it's going to almost always be a lizard of some type. But ground skinks are the ones that really don't climb very well. They spend most of their time on the ground, hence they're well-named. They're our smallest reptile, only about three inches as an adult, so uh, not particularly large. They're really fascinating, though. They actually have a little clear membrane embedded in their eyelid, so when they close their eyes, they can actually still see outside of, of uh, what they can see outside and what, what's going on around them. So pretty cool, uh, you know. A, a good friend of mine, Jeff Bean, he often says, you know, if a ground skink was two feet long, people would think it was the coolest lizard in the world. <laughs> uh, but they, they really are pretty fascinating little animals. Found across most of the state, as you see in the map there. Okay, we have three species of skinks that look really similar, especially as juveniles, and two of them look really similar even through adulthood. So we have the southeastern five-line skink and the five-line skink. Notice they both have five lined in their name. Uh, they both have five stripes that go down the length of their back, five gold or yellowish stripes. In the southeastern five line skink, there's a little bit of separation between that mid dorsal stripe and the next rows of stripes on either side. But really you have to see a lot of these before that becomes uh, something that you notice routinely. Uh, southeastern five line skinks are more common in the coastal plain less common into the Piedmont and into the uh, foothills region. In, in those places, they tend to be more associated with pine forest, uh, maybe than, than hardwood forest, whereas the five-line skink tends to be a little bit more uh, hardwood preferring or, or mixed pine hardwood types of forests, uh, and they tend to be more common in the Piedmont, foothills, and mountains. So. Uh, you have overlap between these two species, but like I say, there's a little bit of habitat separation between them. In the coastal plain, where we principally see southeastern five-line skinks, the five-line skinks are mostly down in the wetter places, wetlands, swamps, things like that are where I tend to find uh, this particular species, the five-line skink. Notice that both of them as juveniles have these young with these brightly colored tails. So the five-line skink on the right there has this beautiful blue tail. And then this one in the upper right for the southeastern five-line skink has even a good bit of purple in the tail there. A lot of times people find these juveniles around and they think that, you know, what in the world could this be? The coloration of that tail has led to one of the, the common names for this being scorpion. People will call them scorpions and I guess assume that maybe they can sting with their tails. 
which they do not do. They, they don't sting with their tails or anything like that. One interesting behavior you see demonstrated here with this uh, female southeastern five-line skink on the right is that after they lay their eggs, they often will attend those eggs until they hatch. And that's for all of the skink species. Um, they will hang out with them. And uh, so there's some amount of parental care, at least while they're in the egg stage. Um, the adults, the adult males of both five-lined and southeastern five-lined tend to get these larger reddish jowls on the sides of their heads, like you see in this photo on the upper left here. That's a good example of a male. And again, both species, five-lined and southeastern five-lined, the males may develop uh, that uh, musculature. Also notice that sometimes in the males, the stripes start to dissipate and they're a little bit less easy to see on them than they are either on the juveniles or on females. So sometimes you may have one and you're not really sure what you're looking at. Well, it really comes down to their tails. And this is one of those where uh, Eumeces is the older recognized genus and the newer recognized genus is Pleistiodon, so that's why you see a different uh, scientific name here. But notice the skink on the right, this is what we're looking at is the upside down skink. So we're looking on the underside of the tail. If you have it in your hand, then you can be sure you know the difference whether you have a southeastern five line or as they call it here, a common five line. And the difference is the scales under the tail. Notice on the southeastern, the middle row of scales, all the scales are just about the same width. But with the um, five line skink on the left side there, the middle row of scales is about twice as wide as the adjacent row of scales. So if you see that middle row of scales that's wider than the adjacent rows, that tells you that it's either the five line skink or the broadhead skink. So the broadhead skink is one we haven't looked at yet. Adults tend to lose all trace of the stripes that they have as juveniles, but they do have those five gold stripes and they're black and they have brightly colored tails as juveniles. So again, sometimes they can be confused with those two species we were just looking at. Broadheads are found just about all across the state, but notice that we're missing a lot of counties where broadhead skinks probably do occur, but we just haven't had them documented before. You can see on the, the bottom left map there. So what do you do if you have a skink that you know it has wider rows underneath the tail, but you're not sure if it's a juvenile broadhead or an adult five-lined? female, which sometimes they retain the blue color into adulthood. Well, then it gets tricky, folks, because then what you have to do is look at the scales on the lip of the animal. And if you start looking at scales on lips of, of, of lizards, it is tough, I promise you. This is where a hand lens can be held handy. <laughs> you have to see how many scales you're counting right in front of the scales that touch the eye, or as is called here, subocular scales, meaning below the eye. So if you count those in front, if there's four scales in front of that, then you have a five line skink. If it's five, it's a broadhead skink. It's tough out there, I'm telling you. Skink identification can be really tricky. But these are a couple things I just wanted to share with um, how the details can matter on some of these species. Our final skink is the coal skink. Uh, you won't confuse him with the other ones if you look really carefully because he does not have that mid dorsal stripe that is present on the other skinks. Uh, it really has sort of a nice uh, black stripe on either side of the body, um, as you can see in this adult in the upper left. On the right, that's a fresh juvenile um, that was at a mountain site uh, that I found uh, this past summer. Uh, sometimes you'll they will uh, lay their eggs in open sunny spaces because those are gonna get a little bit warmer. Notice in this particular species, they really have a foothills and mountains distribution only. And so they're only gonna be found in those places that tend to be a little cooler than other parts of the state. Here's a critter that looks a little bit like the skinks, but it's in a completely different group. And if you look at it carefully, you'll notice some, some important differences. Number one, notice it's not shiny and glossy like all the skinks are, and it actually has one more stripe than the other guys do. So this is six lines in instead of five, right? So if you count them, and you have to be lucky that you get one that's still enough for you to count them. That's the other thing about this species. 
It's very fast. If you have a warm, hot day, and I mean the temperature is 100 or higher, these guys love it. They're very active on those kinds of days, and you can be out in sandy soils and find them uh, zooming around. Uh, they are, without a doubt, our fastest land reptile, uh, up to 22 miles per hour that they've been clocked at. So really, really fast. They're a perfect one if you have someone who has lots of energy and uh, can't sit still very long. You can say, okay, go catch that race runner. They will never catch that race runner, but they'll get a lot of energy expended while they're running around trying to catch one of these. Similar to some other species that we've seen, like the fence lizard, Males of this species will develop a blue coloration underneath their chin and on their sides. So you can see this in the, the, the animal on the top sort of right there. Uh, that's a male. Notice it's not anywhere near as gaudy as what we see on the fence lizard, but it is a, a bluish color, whereas the photo on the left is of a female and doesn't have any of that blue coloration at all. This species really likes sandy type soils. So although you see its distribution into the Piedmont and foothills, it's really a coastal plain specialist and does best in those Piedmont foothills, even mountain sites, if there's some sort of sandy soils or hot, dry conditions uh, that it tends to prefer. Okay, our last three native lizards are all glass lizards and they are legless lizards. So a lot of times people will see them and say, well, what's the difference between a glass lizard and a snake? Well, there's a lot of important differences, and let's look at a few of them. So number one, all of our native lizards, this does not go for the world over, but all of our native lizards have uh, eyelids and ear openings. There are lizards, uh, some types of geckos that do not have eyelids, but again, all of our native lizards do have eyelids. So that means they can close their eyes. So if you're not sure, Pick it up and look right in the eye, and if it winks at you, then you know it was a glass lizard. No, no, don't do that. We do have some species of snakes that are venomous, like this pygmy rattlesnake on the right here, so you wouldn't want to pick him up to determine if he can blink. But they do, uh, the, the lizards will have eyelids. The snakes do not have eyelids. They also have an ear opening. Oops, didn't mean to go forward. You see that ear opening right there on this glass lizard? There is no external ear opening for snakes. And then... They also have this interesting groove on the side of their body. Uh, sometimes it, it, you can s sort of think of it as it sort of divides them into two tones, uh, in this case of this eastern glass lizard, and that is absent on snakes. And finally, their tails are really very long uh, in proportion to their body length. Sometimes their tails can be almost twice as long as the rest of their body. Now, the white bars are roughly where the tails begin on these particular species that we're looking at. This is a eastern glass lizard and a southeastern crown snake. So the tail of the glass lizard, uh, like I say, is, is often you know one and a half times the uh, body length of the animal. And a snake, the tail is generally something like a fifth or less of the overall body size of the, of the snake. So much shorter tails on snakes, much longer on glass lizards. Also notice this particular glass lizard his tail was broken right about here. You can see this is a slightly different color on this tail. So his original tail, we'll call it, probably would have gone maybe almost out to here. So it would have almost been twice the, as long as the body is of this particular lizard. So here is the Eastern glass lizard. Uh, this is the most common glass lizard we have in the state by far. It is principally a coastal plain species although there may be some opportunities for it uh, in the Piedmont. You see there's some, some interesting dots with question marks on them, so I'm not sure what's going on with those, but principally this is a coastal plain species. Um, it does not have a mid-dorsal stripe, and that's important for the next two species. Uh, males, like this bottom left photo, often develop really beautiful green and bluish colors on their heads. They can be really, really a beautiful, attractive animals. So here is the slender glass lizard and the mimic glass lizard. And in both of these cases, these two lizards do have a mid-dorsal stripe that goes all the way down the body, although it's more obvious usually on a glass, slender glass lizard than it is on a mimic glass lizard. Slender glass lizard and mimic glass lizards, you know, there's a lot for us to learn about these two species. 
Uh, they are, the slender is found just about throughout the state. If you look at the dots, there's dots in the mountains, dots in the Piedmont, dots in the coastal plain. But there are a lot of places in between that we don't have records for these animals. Uh, they are a little bit difficult to detect. Uh, they tend to like open grassy types of um, habitats. And uh, so they can disappear into those habitats really quickly. So even if you look in the right kinds of places, you can miss them very easily. But this is a species we're trying to learn more about. It's a really, really fascinating animal. Jeff, do so, you think that there, um, that if we had good detectors out there, that a lot of those counties would show slender glass lizards? I actually do not. So uh, some of it comes down to habitat, right? So you have to have the type of habitat that will support this critter. And you really kind of need almost uh, prairie-like conditions or think of the, uh, what the understory looks like when you find longleaf pine savanna where you have open wiregrass kinds of stuff. That certainly doesn't have to be savanna like that. It can be more prairie-like. So you need open grassy kinds of situations for these animals to be present. I suppose if you, spend a, if you spent a lot of time on maybe power line corridors and parts of the Piedmont or anywhere you find open grassy swaths that um, might meet their uh, situation, it's possible that we might turn up some more records, but I don't anticipate that we would get a lot more records. And because we certainly have spent time looking for this animal, uh, many people have across the state. Uh, one of the ways that you get a lot of the records that we have for reptiles across our state is by finding animals that are run over on the road. While sad to find a deceased animal on the road like that, it does give us a lot of good information about where the animal occurs. And so even if these animals were occurring in a lot of those counties, we would expect to occasionally turn up a road killed animal um, that, that might give us an indication that the animal is found there. And unfortunately, we're not seeing that. That being said, there's always more to learn. There's always uh, more that we could find the more that we look. You know, you don't find anything if you don't go look for it, right, Ann? So uh, that brings us to the mimic glass lizard, called mimic because it has some of the characters of the eastern glass lizard and some of the characters of the slender glass lizard. So it looks a little bit sort of in between, maybe. The mid dorsal stripe sometimes doesn't start right at the head. And I apologize for the photo on the right. It's a little darker on my screen. Maybe it's brighter on yours. This is one that I took in, the, in, in a coastal site in North Carolina. And the stripe starts really right about here-ish. It doesn't go all the way uh, to the head. And this more gaudy individual that you see here, I've only seen one individual in North Carolina that looked beautiful like this. Um, they, they tend to not, I don't tend to see them with all these reticulations on the head, but that is just a really beautiful animal. Like I say, I've seen one like that. And the stripe seems to start, you know, sort of behind all of that. So it doesn't necessarily go right through uh, that, that pattern that you're seeing. Uh, some differences between these two has to do with the number of stripes that you may or may not be able to see underneath the groove, the lateral groove on the side of the animal, as well as some differences in the scales that touch their eye, or as we learned earlier, those are subocular scales. So there can be some nitty gritty details that we need to do for looking to learn about these two species and where they, where they might overlap and which one is where. Mimic glass lizards are only found in the coastal plain, so they don't range up in the Piedmont. So if you find an animal in the Piedmont that has that mid-dorsal stripe, you know it's a slender glass lizard. But it gets more complex if you're down in the southeast corner of the state, uh, which species you might have. In the rare instance that you have both of them in hand, as this individual did, this is my, my good friend Pearson Hill, he actually has a mimic glass lizard in the bottom and a slender glass lizard on the top. It is very uncommon for us in North Carolina to be able to find both species like that. So, Okay, any uh, questions about uh, our natives that have popped up, Ann? Yes, we've got, yes, we've got lots of questions. So we're going back Maybe to just Kate. keep a couple and then I'll, I'll try to, I'll be done here shortly. So maybe a couple now and then I'll finish up. Okay, do animals prefer a certain spot to lay eggs? Um, they generally like somewhere that is slightly moist but not super damp. Um, so they might lay them uh, within, a, a, at the edge, you know, under a log or along the side of a log or in some leaf litter. 
Uh, funny enough, I use PVC pipes standard upright to survey for tree frogs. And with some frequency, I find a single anole egg laid at the bottom of those PVC pipes. Um, so it's just the right humidity down there at the bottom. Uh, and I've tipped them up and rolled them out and actually incubated them and hatched them out. Um, so that's how I know they were anole eggs. Uh, although I was pretty sure that's what they were because it's the only lizard that would that we have that's native that would be able to climb up a pipe and get in there. So anyway, but generally speaking, it's a, a slightly moist condition, but not not super super wet. Okay, Maybe and one this one's from from Jerry Reynolds. How do you record a race runner's speed? Ha, ah, that's a good question. Uh, well, I run around with it with one of those uh, speed guns. No, no, I don't do that. Uh, honestly, I don't know how that speed was determined. Uh, I, it was determined with some uh, other species in that same genus in the Southwest. And I don't, I honestly don't know how they determine the speed. So, okay, let me do a last couple here, Ann, and then we'll, we'll finish, we'll do more questions. Um, so we have two species of lizard that are non-native but are established in the state. One is this really cool, crazy critter, the Texas horned lizard, that has a small population in Onslow County. And although they are amazing, incredibly looking, looking animals to me, they also have a really weird, crazy life, his, life uh, ecology trait. And that is that when they're really completely scared, they have the ability to fill the sinuses behind their eyes with blood and then actually squirt, eye, squirt blood through their eye socket. And this is a lizard that has already done that. And you see that there's actually a little bit of blood on the top of its head. It's not really known how this works for them, if this really does deter predators or what the story is, or if it's, you know, maybe it's so weird that a predator goes, wow, that's the weirdest thing that's ever happened. I'm going to leave this thing alone. We don't really know, uh, but it is uh, something that does happen with this particular species. The other non-native that's now well established in North Carolina is the Mediterranean gecko. You see all these dots on this map. Uh, we have them in about 17, maybe 18 counties. Uh, they tend to be only present in human dominated places. Uh, they like uh, houses, schools, old buildings, like you see the one on the wall on the corner right there on the very edge of your screen. There's one climbing up there. Um, they don't tend to inhabit any natural ecosystems in the state. So we don't think of them really as a threat, nor do we the Texas horn lizard for that matter, uh, just a small population in a very small area. But this guy, again, mostly in homes and buildings, not out in the woods and trees and things like that. So we don't think of it as necessarily problematic. How do they do this? Well, how do they climb like that? They have these special... Uh, pieces on their toe pads. Incidentally, anoles have this as well, although not quite as highly developed, called lamellae. And that's those lines that you see underneath each one of these toes. And those actually adhere to the surface that they're trying to climb and allow them to climb up surfaces that are just super, super smooth. Um, even just, you know, plain old glass, they're able to, to, to climb those sorts of surfaces because of those lamellae. But really pretty interesting critter. Uh, as with many of the species that are native, we're also interested in getting more records for where these guys occur. We're especially interested in these two guys that appear to be possible invaders to our state. We do have records for both of these species in a number of different places. We believe up till now all of these are non-reproducing populations, which is what helps us determine whether we think they are established in the state or not. We don't think either of these species is currently reproducing in North Carolina, but it's possible that they do. Uh, the brown anole is a real uh, threat to our native green anole, and the black and white tegu on the left is a large lizard. You can't really tell the scale probably here, but these guys get, you know, two, three feet long or, or larger sometimes, and they eat just about anything they want to, including a lot of native lizards, snakes, and lots of other critters. So we really don't want either of these species established, but if you happen to see one or the other of these, you're welcome to send me a note or an email. A lot of times people get confused about the brown anole. How can they tell if they have a brown colored green anole or a true brown anole? Um, well, it has to do with uh, some of the patterning on the body. And you'll notice that if you have an adult male, 
they have a fairly well-developed crest and sometimes a little bit of a sail across the back of their uh, body. This is variable, however, on males. It's not always as, as, um, as uh, obvious as it is on this one, and sometimes it's actually more obvious. Sometimes it's a bigger uh, crest there and even a bigger sail on, the, on their back that goes all the way down their tail. But definitely those are some to be on the lookout for. Currently, we found brown anoles in nurseries uh, where people are bringing in plants, especially from the southeast, especially Florida, and they've invaded Florida, and so they, they show up on, on those plants. We think that our winter is probably right at the edge of their ability to survive, so we're hopeful that, that we won't get any established. The tegu is a little bit different story. We may Our weather may not be quite cold enough to prevent their establishment, uh, but like I say, we don't really have any... any um, current indication that they have established populations anywhere. So how can you learn more? Well, you can go to herpsofnc.org and click on the lizards tab there, and then you'll learn all about the species that occur in our state. This is a really nice little online field guide that you can use. You can go to our own, web, my, the website of my agency, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, ncwildlife.org. We have a number of different wildlife profiles for lots of different reptiles, including several lizards, like this eastern fence lizard uh, one here. And finally, you can help us learn more about where some of these critters occur. Uh, you can go to a place called herpmapper.org, which is a citizen science project, or the Carolina Herp Atlas, like you see on the lower part there. Uh, you can go to one of these places and record your sightings of lizards, and this will help us learn about where they occur. Here's a photograph of a slender glass lizard that was taken by a friend of mine and posted onto Herp Mapper this summer. So this helped us uh, add one more dot on the map for this uh, species that we don't know as much about. Right now we have over 24,000 observations just in North Carolina on Herp Mapper. So it's a really, really valuable place for me to go and gather information to learn more about our, our lizards. I really want to acknowledge these folks that helped me with any photos that didn't have a name by them. They were either mine or one of these folks, uh, J.D. Wilson, Todd Pearson, Pearson Hill, Jeff Bean, Thomas Reed, Trip Lamb, and April Lemons. And with that, we'll keep going with the questions. Okay, great talk, Jeff. Uh, we have a question about um, tegus dropping off their tails. Are they able to do that? You know, I think that they actually are. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that they're as adept at doing that as other lizards, but I'm pretty sure that I had a tegu at one time in a captive situation that did actually drop part of its tail, just the very, very tip, or sometimes you might hear it called as the distal end of the tail. They, they can drop that very tip, but it's not the same as you see with most of our native lizards. Okay, here's another one. Is the blue-tailed skink a five-lined skink? Maybe is the answer. So if you see a blue-tailed skink, that is a juvenile of one of our native species. It could be a five-lined skink, a southeastern five-lined skink, or a broadhead skink. So that's where you have to do a little bit more digging. You have to look at the scales under the tail and the scales on the lip. So skink identification is not so simple. All right, when taking pictures of five line skinks, what should we try uh, to get pictures of that would help researchers differentiate between the different skinks? That's a good, good, good question. Uh, usually if you get a reasonable shot of the top of the animal so that you can see all of the stripes or most of the stripes, um, then, then most herpetologists can look at that photo and tell you, excuse me, which species they're looking at. So yeah, if you can just get a sort of a top-down photo or even a side that includes the top, you, most of us can, can identify what species we're looking at. Do you ever look at iNaturalist for North Carolina sightings? I sure do. In fact, I started a, an amphibian and reptile collecting piece in iNaturalist about three years ago, and that, and that uh, particular collector has it has many more than Herp Mapper. It probably has 45,000 uh, records in it, so another really good place. But I do encourage you, if you collect data using iNaturalist, please do choose that you're collecting them as part of that project, Amphibians and Reptiles of North Carolina, because otherwise, 
yeah, otherwise I can't see the exact locality of where those things came from. All right. Are glass lizards surface feeders and active at night? Do they use burrows? Will they feed on mice in prairie settings? Lots of good questions. So principally they are active during the daytime. Uh, most of our lizards are mostly active during the daytime. They're not really active at night at all. You may get occasional activity from glass lizards in uh, crepuscular time, so dawn and dusk, especially on days that are really, really super hot. There may be a, a, a frenzy of activity at that time, but you're not going to really have them active at night. Yes, they use burrows in the ground, although they also use a lot of natural holes that are out. They don't make their own burrows, to be clear. Uh, they may use holes that other animals make in the ground, uh, stump holes uh, where you have a root channel that's, that's um, left open and exposed. They may use that as a place to burrow. Um, I would not put it past a slender glass lizard to eat small mammals for sure. Uh, mimic glass lizard and maybe a large eastern glass lizard. If, if they found um, like um, uh, a, a nest for a mouse or something like that with little bitty ones, I, I imagine they, they might possibly eat those. But I don't think it's probably a large part of their diet but I, I suspect they would eat it if they, if they happened upon that. And that seems one like there's one more piece to that, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> well, we're just going to have one last question, and then we're going to wind it up. And okay. this is from Debbie Willis. If you find a nest that has been disturbed, is it best to leave alone or incubate at another site? Does changing the orientation of an egg have adverse effect on embryo development or even viability? She understands what that uh, situation yeah. is as regards turtles. Yeah. Uh, she's interested in the question, answer for lizards. It's, it's the same in all reptiles. So the embryo attaches to the side of the shell. So if you turn the egg, you will potentially damage the embryo inside. So if you find a nest, let's say you roll a log and you find some eggs under there and the female's there and maybe she runs off or, or you don't see the female, she's not there. Best thing to do is leave the eggs exactly where they are try to put the materials that are back around them, whether they be leaves or a log or, or whatever the situation was. Um, you want to try to put all that back exactly as you found it and leave the eggs as they were. Yep. All right. Well, that's it. We give uh, Jeff a big hand. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I certainly learned a lot and I'll be looking forward to hearing from Tara about the next presentation in this North Carolina Wildlife Federation series.